Harry Crosby is one of the great modern explorers of Baja California. He spent months on muleback in its rugged, mountainous interior, discovering and recording its ancient cave art. And he became fascinated with the daily lives and the history of its current inhabitants, some of whom are the descendants of the soldiers who accompanied the first Jesuit missionaries to Baja California 200 years ago. He documented these adventures in books like Last of the Californios, The Cave Paintings of Baja California, and Antigua, California. And here he introduces us to this other Baja California. I'm Harry Crosby, and I've been asked to take some retrospective views of my relationship to Baja California, which began actually in 1966 when I was uh, asked to, well actually I got a contract to illustrate a book for the Commission of the Californias on the Portola Serra expedition and the opening of Alta California and the founding of San Diego. In order to fulfill that contract, I was to go to Loreto, the original capital of California, and follow Portola and Serra's trail all the way to San Francisco Bay and to make photographs of the country, quote, as they would have seen it, unquote, and to keep adequate notes so that the editors of the work, which was going to be based on the diaries of Portola and Serra, would uh, be able to relate my photographs and so forth to the diaries and my trail notes to help them describe the country and so forth in a book that they would put out. So I went down uh, with Paul Ganster, an ex-student of mine, presently the director of the Institute for the Regional Studies of the Californias at San Diego State University. And he and I, he then a graduate student at UCLA, bought mules and rode 600 miles between roughly Comondu and uh, San Telmo in Baja California and photographed the pertinent places along the way. We were attempting to follow the Camino Real as best we could with the advice of local people. And during that trip, the most important things that happened to me actually had nothing to do with my job at all. It was the fact that uh, I got to see the, what I consider to this day to be some fabulous scenery. I met some wonderful people who are the a living survival of the old Spanish frontier culture and uh, encountered the prehistoric rock art of the peninsula and the botany and zoology and a lot of the other advantages that uh, that, that peninsula offers to us. I came home a very different person than I went and uh, my wife sometimes contends that I never did come home and I certainly came home a different person than I went. And in subsequent years, I have branched out and tried to develop in a meaningful sort of way the interests that were piqued by my first encounter these 31 years ago. The change that I perceived in myself <coughs> over a period of time was that I saw opportunities to pamper my own interests, which was to, to literally get to know those people well. I, I had met them on the first trip, and I'd been a guest in their homes and mountain ranches, but th those encounters raised many, many questions in my mind, and they also left me with a what I was convinced at the time had to be an overly romanticized view of people who seemed to me to be living in ways that were almost too good to be true. I refer there not to their economic situations, which were certainly very simple and humble, but their relations with each other, with their families, their parents, their children, uh, and, and with me as an outsider. I, I had 
They awakened in me feelings that I don't recall really ever feeling in any other place I visited, and I've done my share of traveling. I, I found it to be a unique experience. And coupled with the country, and then the gradual unfolding of the fact that this, all of these things had not been well studied. The country hadn't been well studied. The, certainly the rock art proved to be very understudied. And the people that I found interesting and admirable and very much in my mind to this day, I see them not as them in a world of them and us, but as us. They exhibited a lot of the characteristics that we attribute to our pioneer past, uh, the, the people who opened uh, the American West and so forth. And in fact, of course, their families were there a hundred years before Americans came to the so-called American West. But it was that sort of thing that, that stimulated me to try to study and record and write in order that what, what interested me might be available to other people. Because as a retired educator, I've always had the feeling that experiences are only meaningful if you can impart them to someone. I, I, to this day, I think it's a very selfish thing to just go out and entertain yourself and have no other end in mind. And in fact, from a selfish standpoint, if I go places and take pictures and interview the people and tape record and carry away a lot of information, I find that I had a better time and learned more than I would have if I'd gone and, and uh, kicked back. Well, my introduction to the uh, painted rock art in Baja California was afforded by my, my first introduction by um, the Via Vicencio Gainor brothers at Rancho La Candelaria on the northern slopes of the Sierra de Guadalupe. I rode in in 1967, as I said, with Paul Ganster, and our guide at the time was Guillermo Via Vicencio Ro Rosas. And uh, he was a very observant, bright fellow. And it happened that while we were visiting the brothers Via Vicencio Gainor, that one of them mentioned that there was rock art in the valley there near La Candelaria and asked if we had seen it. And of course, we'd never been there before. And Guillermo was the one who actually talked us into it because it was out of our way a mile or so. And he was curious because he'd never seen it. So uh, we said, sure, let's go. So we, we rode over across a great slope and there was a huge volcanic rock. No exaggeration say it was 50 feet in diameter and it had rolled out onto the plain there. And uh, on the, I would say it would be the southeast side of it or maybe the east side of it, where it rolled under, it had been painted. And there were some rather handsome paintings. I, I would say there was a dozen paintings there at least and two or three of them were in quite good shape. I remember there was a mountain sheep and a deer and I photographed them and we said, gee, this is great. This must be the stuff that Earl Stanley Gardner visited and reported on. And isn't it wonderful to be here and see it? The following day, we saw another rock art site at a place called San Borjitas Norte, not to be confused with the famous San Borjitas. And uh, again, I had that feeling of, Paintings weren't in very good condition, but I thought, well, yes, this is the sort of stuff that I've been reading and hearing about. And we went on our way. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to the whole thing for two or three years until I was at the Bancroft Library one day. I got wondering just what has been done on the rock art in Baja California. So I looked up in their extensive holdings to see what they had and wound up getting out every single work that they had referenced or cross-referenced under rock art in Baja California. And after I had looked at everything they had, I realized that nothing that I had seen had appeared in any of the reported uh, works or the collected works. 
So almost immediately I began to think, the next time I go down there, I've got to talk to people about rock art because I suspected already that the phenomenon was much, much bigger than it had been reported because the paintings I'd seen for the most part weren't even in the same Sierra that Gardner and me and and all had visited. So the next time I went down and, and I got a really competent guide, the great guide of my, my time in Baja California, Tajo Arce, and started talking to him uh, I've recorded all this in my book, The Cave Paintings of Baja California, but just to repeat it briefly, Tacho took me to a few of the places that he knew, and he was a great assistance to me in talking to ranchers we visited along the way, and one thing led to another, and we found there, there seemed to be almost an endless opportunity to find and see new rock art sites because each rancher knew a few paintings in the immediate vicinity of his ranch, even though he might not know anything about ones at a, at a distance. So I made for several years a sort of a secondary career out of riding around. I spent nine months on muleback in the Sierra de San Francisco, Guadalupe, San Borja, and a week in the Sierra de San Juan, and saw literally 180 or 200 sites. I, the, the discrepancy in number, by the way, is due to the fact that you have to really rather carefully define what you mean by a rock art site. But to this awaked the idea that the phenomenon, the surface, had barely been scratched in spite of the fact that it had been known to the Jesuits 200 years before and two or three other people had seen various examples in the meantime. Nobody had been curious enough to examine it and determine what the perimeters of the phenomenon were and what the neighboring art styles might be and so forth and so forth. It was quite rare to go to a ranch and get an informant who knew the location of rock art and was also willing to take us to look at it. It did happen occasionally, but more typically, they were either older men whose mule riding days were over, or at least whose interest in riding mules was over or very reduced. And so we found ourselves a lot of the time taking down elaborate verbal descriptions of uh, arroyos, cañadas, different layers of cantil, which is the, the geological construction in which most of the paintings are placed, and then finding ourselves going out with my guide, the guide I employed, who would take us uh, to a place, a suitable campsite, and then we would usually spend an impatient night at the campsite and get up at the crack of, well, well before dawn, actually, and uh, set out by the early light to try to put ourselves into a place to find the paintings and evaluate them and photograph them. The reason for all the haste was that we didn't have unlimited time and uh, it was very frustrating to arrive at a site, say, at noon and find that in order to photograph it properly, you should have been there at 9.30 a.m. So we, we got into the habit of going out very early and making, doing our climbing and trying to be places when the light first hit. Of course, that had the converse was true also. We'd get to places maybe at 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning and find that the light wasn't going to be right there until maybe 3 in the afternoon. Because the, typically when you want to photograph Baja California rock painting in situ, the only, only practical way to do it, is to uh, wait until the sun is shining off the floor of the cave but no light is striking the wall on which the paintings are located. That way you get the maximum reflected light and no direct light. So uh, there was a lot, we had a lot of adventures and we did some strange things like identifying a site. I remember, for example, the first time I saw the famous serpent cave in Arroyo del Parral, 
we went off and uh, found two more rock art sites nobody had reported while we waited for the light to get off the surface of the cave. It happens to be a place you can't photograph until noon or so because in the morning the light shines right in on the paintings and the contrast is terrible and the, the rough rock surface photographs is so prominent in the photograph that you can hardly see the paint. So uh, we had all kinds of adventures relating to the practical problems of photographing the paintings. But the, 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 the real adventures that were involved were putting together the clues that we were given at the ranches, going to the designated places, and then attempting to find not only the paintings that were called to our attention, or had been called to our attention, but also not to go away and leave other paintings because I knew with a little bit of experience that the local people did not have much interest in the paintings in those days. Now today they do, but in those days they had very little interest. They would identify one prominent painting catalog it in their minds, yes there are paintings up the Arroyo de la Tinaja and of course, it would never have occurred to them to go and investigate a lot of other rock shelters in the same arroyo or even in the same level of Contillo. So what we found was that uh, one thing we, I could employ uh, guy, spry guides like Tacho Arce's son Ramon, and while we were photographing one that we had been directed to, Ramon could be out trolling the pursuing the whole layer of Contil for maybe as up to a mile and bring us back a report about whether it did or didn't have other material in it. And not always did we send somebody out, sometimes we went out ourselves looking. But that way we were able to add a great deal to what the local people knew. Not so much in bringing whole new areas into their intelligence, but simply expanding what they knew by finding a lot more of the paintings than they had any hunch about. The great mural rock art of central Baja California shares a great deal, I'm convinced, with some of the famous rock art uh, mother loads around the world, like southern France and Spain, uh, the, the Tassili and Ager in the Sahara, uh, probably the Aboriginal paintings in Australia, in that it was an important ceremonial uh, expression on the part of the people that I call the painters, for lack of a better term. There's absolutely no reason to believe this was not the case. These are not daubs. These are paintings sometimes 35 feet up on rock surfaces that almost certainly were 35 feet up when they were painted several thousand years ago and you don't put yourself up 35 feet casually. You go and fell palms and split them and make uh, scaffoldings and you have to make cordage to tie perhaps cardone wands ac across for rungs on your scaffold and you have to go great distances to find volcanic rock to, that's colorful to grind up to make these remarkably colorful paintings. So an immense amount of effort was gone to by people whose economic needs were very pressing, whose lives were very close to the bone, and yet they were willing to make all this effort. So I, I personally think that the arguments in favor of it having what we would call, for lack of a better term, religious connotations, are overwhelming arguments. I can't imagine anything else that could possibly have stimulated this kind of uh, artistic endeavor. As far as who the people were, uh, in spite of the fact that various groups are studying the paintings and, and doing archaeology on the area, uh, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that anyone has been able to pinpoint the, the people that were involved. And I personally consider that calling them Cochi Me simply because the Cochi Me were the people in the area at the time of Spanish contact. I think this is highly oversimplified. We have absolutely no evidence at all that the Cochi Me were there continuously for several thousand years. And in fact, 
uh, as I have recorded in my book. The Jesuits had it reported to them by the Cochimi that they were not the painters, that the painters were uh, people who had come from the north and they were sort of a legendary people to the Cochimi. And to bear this out, the Jesuits were an astute group of people and they were there in that area for several decades and well-educated and observant, and they saw absolutely no sign that the local people were grinding any rock and making any paint and doing any of that sort of thing. So uh, I think the, the painters remain stubbornly mysterious, and I think it's going to take a great deal more work to suggest who they were and, and what their culture was like otherwise, because even when we occasionally find artifacts in the caves, typically there's no way to tie those artifacts to the paintings. The paintings are on the walls above, the artifacts are on the floor below, and the peninsula has demonstrably been visited by waves of people over the last 10,000 years. And who did what when is not yet understood. So I prefer to consider this an open book and the, the mystery of the painters yet to be solved. The great mural art is characterized by a great deal of conventional uh, behavior. By conventional, I mean these people, this art form had a, a uh, cultural basis just as rigid as that of, say, dynastic uh, Egyptian funereal art in the, uh, in the pyramids. The, the animals, the birds, the uh, humans, the quadrupeds that were painted by the painters in Baja California were given highly conventionalized, almost uh, rigid, they developed rules that were followed by everyone. And we can't go into a lot of detail about it, but it's noteworthy that, for instance, the outlines are quite realistic, so that when they draw a mountain sheep or they draw a human figure or a bird, any of several kinds of recognizable birds or fish like manta rays or, or uh, pinnipeds or dolphins or things like that, you're not left mystified as to what it might be. The outline is uh, quite realistic and also follows, as I say, a lot of conventions. Um, but the outline is the only realistic thing about these paintings. This is something that anyone, anyone interested in ceremonial art would be uh, it has almost a, an icon character because the, the other side of the coin about the outlines being severely realistic is that the infill patterns bear no observable connection to reality whatsoever. And that is without exception. In other words, if you look at the detail that you will find inside any of these figures, regardless, you cannot identify any of that detail with anything observable on the birds, fish, snakes, or men that are depicted. So we have something which, of course, I am unable to explain, but we have something about the symbolic or the icon quality of these paintings, these figures, where the, the way the interior is painted or for that matter, not painted. Some of them are just outline figures. That had some kind of symbolic content that we cannot relate to, even at the same time that we can totally relate to the realistic outline. It's, a, it's an interesting fugue. I relate to the, the primitive, the prehistoric art in Baja California, and in my mind, I relate to it very closely. But it's not the kind of relationship in which I perceive specific messages from the painters. It isn't a question of feeling that I can interpret the paintings in any way, shape, or form, or that I have any special insight as to what their precise intentions were in painting them. What I do get out of them is an intense feeling of
of uh, my fellow man, of shared humanity. Art and human, humankind, human culture are inseparable companions. They're, they're, to my knowledge, there's never been any group of people detected, no sizable group of people, ever having occupied our planet that didn't create art. And the, the uh, great mural art is, in my mind, a very admirable example of what we're talking about. This is, uh, I find beautiful, I find it expressive, I see in their realistic depictions of their of themselves, that is, of humans and of of their uh, fellow beasts, no doubt that they preyed upon, or at a veces were preyed upon. Uh, they do depict, after all, mountain lions. They couldn't have had a very easy relationship with mountain lions. Uh, nevertheless, the the kinship you sense in how those animals are depicted. And the, the communication of that art from some impossibly ancient time, I mean, in my mind there's no question that a great deal of it is, is farther back than Christ in our system, and yet the communication is very high because you sense in it a, a kind of humanity that finding metates and mimanos, the grindstones, or arrowheads, or spearheads, or fish hooks, or a little piece of cordage. Those are homelier and more humble artifacts. The paintings, to me, come closer to the idea of communication. They're not just practical uh, devices. They are man's attempt to communicate his beliefs, perhaps, his, his hopes, his dreams, to communicate with his deities, and to communicate with, and incidentally, with me. Well, I was attracted to the people themselves, and I, I now refer not to the painters, but to the people living in the Sierras of Baja California almost immediately within probably three days of starting my trip in Komondu in 1967. I had a, a sharp sense that I was dealing with a common culture, people that were very tightly related to each other and shared a practically universal set of beliefs and behavior. But more than that, it was also that I almost immediately sensed a kind of a, a community and a, uh, these are, were relaxed people who were at home with each other and in the bosom of their families, who, who greeted outsiders, even at places where I was told that I was the first outsider who had ever visited, in a very open, very frank fashion, and invited a great deal of hospitality was expended. And I began to think, within a matter of weeks after first meeting them, I began to think that they were a people living in a kind of uh, comfort with themselves and in, in harmony with each other to a greater degree than any people that I was conscious of having spent much time among. And I was interested in that. And uh, intellectually, when I got home from that first trip, I attempted to find out what I could about them. And I found that the sources of information on the people living in the mountains of Baja California were extremely limited and extremely unsatisfactory. And that meant that the next time I went down there, I started to make local inquiry. I started uh, tape recording conversations. I think it was on my second trip in the mountains that I started making genealogy cards because I wanted to know more about how they were all related to each other. And I persisted in that for years, and I've collected a couple of thousand genealogy cards from the mountains. And I've talked to some of the most famous memoristas of my time, a memorista being an older person, man or woman, who was regarded as having a particularly retentive memory of all the people and their relationships and so forth. And out of these contacts, 
I uh, not only developed a great admiration for this cohesive culture, but I also, in studying it on the outside, I found that there's good and sufficient reason for its cohesiveness and its uh, comfort on the land. They, I discovered that the people have been there a very long time. Uh, even in the mid-peninsula, which wasn't settled as early as some of the other parts, uh, those same families have been there for 200 years and more. And uh, I found that the, their ancestors were almost probably 80% of them were mission servants or soldiers from the Spanish period. And tracing them has become an avocation of mine, and, and of course I've included it in virtually all my work. And that, uh, that picture of a culture, a kind of a survival, of a pocket of isolated people on a very isolated frontier, Baja California people in the mountains in particular uh, are about as un-Indian as you can possibly imagine in Mexico. This doesn't mean that they don't have any Indian ancestry. I wouldn't be surprised if 30 or 40 percent of their genetic ancestors might not be Indians. However, most of those were mainland Indians and most of the mestizaje, the mixing of the races, took place before their ancestors came to Baja California but they, their sense of the Indian past is non-existent. They're about as Hispanic as anybody you could find from Mexico. They, 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 they might as well be detached Spaniards for all of their, their cultural background. And uh, then the other side of that, it, it's again, I keep talking about fugues, this kind of a, not cross purposes, but strangely related strands, is that they are so completely plugged into the local landscape, or were when I first met them, that they were uh, independent. That is to say, they were literally living off the land. They had worked out techniques to take advantage of the bounties of nature, if you can call that peninsula bountiful, and also how to work it, how to make the cattle and the goats and the vegetables and fruits they were able to grow work for them and support them, sustain them. And they, their relationship to the land was a highly practical one. They, they knew how to employ everything. They knew the usages of all the herbs and the teas they could make out of things. At the same time, this led them to be rather opaque or I should say them to be rather blind to things that were of no use to them. So for example, one of the commonest themes when I took up the rock art and started asking about it was a lack of interest. Several of my, ultimately my best informants, and of course many, many times that many of people who weren't able to be my informants would say, well, Yes, there are paintings, but I've never paid any attention to them. Uh, they, they don't mean anything. And my favorite story about this of all time was when I was talking to Loreto Arce Aguilar at Rancho San Gregorio. And Loreto wasn't really, he wasn't a loquacious man, and he wasn't particularly verbal. And he sort of spoke when, he answered when he was spoken to. And I pressed him, rather, about the paintings at San Gregorito, where he was a boy, where he was raised. And I said, how did they compare to the paintings at San Gregorio, which I had by then seen, which was the ranch he founded? And I pressed him on this subject when he obviously wasn't very anxious to talk about it. And finally, he was sort of exasperated. And he said to me, when I asked him what kind of paintings were at San Gregorito, he said, Big paintings, little paintings, the kind everyone has. And when he said the kind everyone has, I realized that that was the mountain people in the mid-peninsula's perception of the world, was that everywhere you went there was rock art. And of course, in a sense, it was absolutely true. But in the, at the same time, they placed very little value on it because in the first place, it wasn't Christian. It wasn't done by them or their ancestors. It wasn't done for any purpose they could relate to. 
and it had no survival value to them at all. Now today things have changed. In the Sierra de San Francisco in particular, people are making a living, and in some cases a much better living than they made before, by taking tourists in to see some of these paintings, and attitudes have changed. And you find young men now going out and looking for paintings, something that would have been unheard of in the time when I first went there. We all complain about how much the peninsula has changed, but truly the change has been mostly to the human landscape and to the road and the areas around the road. The changes otherwise are relatively modest as yet, and there's still a great deal of old, new, or whatever you want to call it, Baja California, to be uh, enjoyed as it would have been two or three hundred years ago. I guarantee you can put yourself a lot of places that you would be unable to fix in time if it were not for your own sense of the present.